Good morning, y'all. Y'all ready to start singing some Christmas carols? We try not to inundate inundate you the entire season, so we're just going to do a couple today. Little by little, you'll get a little more.
good morning, everybody. You guys can have a small seat just for a short amount of time. <laughs> if you like how I said that, a small seat. <laughs> just a little bit. This much time. Isn't that what it is? This much time? This much time? Those of you Emmaus folks out there, you know what that means. We're so glad that you have joined us online this morning and here in our space. Um, it's just a good time to be together to celebrate um, this season. And I want to give you some... Um, some dates and times and if you want to make sure that you spread the word around um some good stuff good stuff first of all um related to horizons through the christmas season first we're going to be doing some christmas caroling up in our to our neighbors up here so if you guys want to you do not have to uh play an instrument you just have to want to have joy in your in your heart and sing bob and anna i know you'll come and join um anybody that wants to just share some love okay this is not for uh even if you think i don't sing real great you do the lord sing the lord hears in key and we're going to be doing it as a group so we need a lot of voices to share some love so we're going to be doing that on tuesday december the 20th we'll meet down here at 6 30 so that we can gather everyone around and then we're going to ring our first doorbell at seven and uh we're going to stop around nine if it rains on Wednesday night, on Tuesday, we'll go on Wednesday, December 21st. Bring your flashlights, headlights, whatever. Um, Teresa Williams, we appreciate her and Scott coordinating this. They'll have song sheets, and uh, Scott will be, you know, singing. Scott's going to sing, right, Scott and Teresa? So uh, bring your friends, bring your neighbors. I think Teresa's working on getting some um, information to hand out to folks to invite them to church. Um, over the Christmas holidays and we're going to be doing Christmas Eve here at 6 o'clock and yes it's 6 Pastor Dan because I gave 6 to Kathy I looked <laughs> so we'll be at 6 here there's a 4 o'clock at the main campus that's a family service 6 here and then 8 at the main campus as well so 4, 6 and 8 um, depending on where you want to do or, or what you want to do so we will have a a version of a candlelight service here if you notice there are sprinklers above your head I was a little afraid of using live candles with that <laughs> did not want it to be a rainy that would not have been good <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm like yeah better not use real candles in here <laughs> what was that yeah it would have been remember your baptism Scott would have been like Vicki what were you thinking <laughs> It's a ba- it would have been a baby shower, but instead we will, we will use candles, just battery-operated ones. So please come. <laughs> Little baby Jesus, yes. Um, Sam would have been watching online thinking, why did she do that? <laughs> I'm glad I'm not there. I thought we were done with water problems at Horizons. So anyway, um, we will be here at 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve. And um, on Christmas morning, um, what a time to come to church. What a time to come to church on Christmas morning. So um, the main campus is going to be celebrating at 1030. We will be here at 1115. Uh, so everybody has time to eat breakfast and uh, come and uh, celebrate Christmas. I mean, c- truly celebrate the best gift you could ever give on Christmas morning. So we'll b- that'll be our plans for the Christmas upcoming next few weeks. There is also a paper bag pageant on Wednesday, December the 7th, so that's this this Wednesday, um, with the potluck meal beginning at 6. That's invited for everybody, and that is at the main campus as well. Good stuff, y'all. Good stuff, y'all. Um, just as a point of information, um, the discernment committee has met, and we will start our discernment meetings starting next week so if you have any questions regarding that process you can talk to me you can talk to anyone on the committee there's several of us so I'll be glad to answer questions as we go along Uh, Dan is a great resource he's one of the Holston Conference trustees so he's a great resource as well so um, we just encourage you to get educated and go to holston.org if you have any questions as well and uh, gosh it's good let's worship this morning y'all staying with us Is my 
takes a hold of say that all the time so grateful for all that you've done for me because we don't deserve it we just don't deserve it but gosh he loves us anyway I'm so grateful for that and I know you guys are too as we go into our prayer time this morning we were talking this morning and Sam says have we done this song lately and I'm like I don't remember maybe a month or so ago and it's Lord I need you and we could sing this every week just to remind us that how we need him Every week, every day, Lord, I need you every hour. Don't we all need him to come in and just <sighs> fill us up? So as we go into this prayer time this morning, I'm just going to encourage you all that if you've got anything specific that you need, lift it up in prayer. Dan's here. He'll gladly pray with you. If you want to put something online and it's public, please feel free to do that. That's what we come to do, to just share our <sighs> what's on our hearts and minds. And if you want to just be grateful and lift that up in praise, do that as well. I mean, we got to remember to do that more often. If you want to put something on the cross, we encourage you to do that. Let's just be grateful that we can say, Lord, I need you. And he hears us. And he already knows it. Let's just be humble in that. Lord, I need you this morning. So I encourage you to sing with us because I know you guys know this song. Lord, I 
come I confess Bowing here I find my rest Without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I deep your grace is born where grace is found is where you are and where you Temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my open. Jesus, how we need you, and how you knew so many years ago that how much we would need you, that you sent your one and only son as a baby into this world to understand us, to learn, to embrace, and then to go on the cross as sacrifice for each and every one of us. Lord, that's how much we need you. And you knew it. You knew it from creation till today, how much we would need you. So, Lord, thank you for that this morning. Thank you for that every day, every hour. And, Lord, for when we don't say it enough and we don't, we don't focus on it enough and we just go about our daily, our daily lives and rush, rush, rush for all those times that we don't thank you enough. Thank you for forgiving us. And thank you for loving us anyway. 
Lord, we just lift up a lot of folks that are going through different things during this holiday season. Lord, we know that you understand what they're going through, whether it be physical, mental, emotional, financial, all the strife that we deal with on this earth. Lord, we know that you're already there. And that no matter what the situation, you provide hope in a world that's not always hopeful. So Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for the promise that this is only a temporary home. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the message that you laid on Dan's heart this morning. And Lord, we just pray that we'll hear it this morning and we'll take it in and we'll absorb it. And that sometime this week, we'll have an opportunity to use it. That you'll provide us an opportunity to be your hands and feet in this world. So Lord, help us to be bold in that opportunity. Help us to share your light in whatever it is. And however you need us to. Because sometimes it's just being kind to someone. Giving someone a smile or a hug. Or just opening a door. And sometimes it's just keeping our mouth shut. And that's hard for some of us sometimes, Lord. So Lord, we just pray that you'll give us that wisdom in every situation to be your reflection in this world. Because that's what we're called to do. Lord, we pray for our church as we're making some decisions and um, some opportunities and some learning opportunities, Lord. So we just pray that you'll just be with each and every one. That it's your heart and your light that we are to reflect. Lord, thank you for this time of year for us to just sit back and soak it in. Thank you for Jesus. For it is, it is in his mighty name that we ask all these things. Amen. Good morning. It is uh, wonderful to see you again. I missed you last week, but I'm so grateful for Barbara filling in. Um, it's really nice to be with Dad, just a couple extra days to um, really focus on him and be with him, so I appreciate that. I'm very grateful for that time. Um, let me sit behind you, Sam. I'm going to grab this stool to assist me. So our um, scripture reading comes from... Uh, Matthew chapter 3. I've been reading a lot out of Luke's gospel, and in Advent, which is that season of preparation that leads us into Christmas, um, you may know this, uh, it comes from the, the Latin phrase meaning the coming. Uh, the coming is the verb that is used, uh, Adventus, and so we get that, the coming of Christ. And as Barbara shared last week, uh, we focus, strangely enough, as we start to orient towards Christmas, we focus on Jesus' second coming. Uh, moving toward the manger scene. Uh, so it's this time, really, that, that jumps us off in Advent uh, to a season of preparation. And the second Sunday of Advent is usually a focus on John the Baptist. So you're thinking, well, when do we get to the baby in the manger? He's cute and cuddly, and I want to get there. So we're going to get there. We're going to get there. But I think what the, the church has recognized, the historical church, and I love this about um, the seasons of the church, is uh, we are so eager to jump into Christmas. I saw Christmas trees at Lowe's in August, <laughs> right? We're so eager to do that. Um, and, and, you know, let me, let me point the finger at me. You know, I'm in a, a Christmas show <laughs> that's running in November before Thanksgiving, right? Buddy the Elf. Um, so we're so eager to jump to Christmas um, that sometimes we run the risk of skipping Advent. And, and the wisdom of the church is Advent's a season that just invites us to slow down and really prepare and think about what it means for the coming of Christ. So today in our scripture, we're going to focus on 
uh, John the Baptist. John, now, he, he wasn't like in the Baptist church. <laughs> uh, he um, is actually sometimes called John the Baptizer, or if you want to be cool and impress your friends, you can call him J-Bap. Um, you know, so that's acceptable too. Uh, but here's a reading from Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. If you've got your Bibles, if you want to follow along on uh, your favorite Bible app, I uh, welcome you to do that. We're going to read from verses 1 to 12. So I want to invite you to hear God's word. Um, don't just think of this as some story about some crazy guy named John the Baptist, if you know anything about him. He was pretty wacky. Uh, but he had God's word and, and spirit in him. Um, and the hope is that that same spirit that filled John with God's word uh, is, is working on your heart today, too. So we invite you in that spirit to hear this word of God. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea. Now, he's an adult here, so this is not the cute baby story. Proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, John wore clothing of camel's hair. Yuck. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say yuck. I said yuck. Uh, now, John wore clothing of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locust and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all of Judea were going out to him and all of the region along the Jordan River. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able, to, God is able from these stones to raise up the children of Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees, trees, and every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptized you with water for the repentant. I, gosh, let me try that again. I baptized you with water for repentance. But there's one who is more powerful than I that is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God, indeed. So I don't know if you've started getting Christmas cards yet. I have, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's cool to reopen your Christmas cards in Advent. It helps us prepare, and, and I, I love just the practice of when I get one, I think about that person and offer a quick prayer for them. Uh, um, so it's just a cool thing. You know, I'm hearing from people. We used to live in Washington, D.C. years ago, I mean decades ago, and my first card was from a dear friend named Bill uh, who sent me a card and just made me think of him and, and reminisce. So it's a great thing. But, you know, I've noticed that every Christmas card uh, is something about Jesus. No surprise, right? <laughs> As you would expect. And I have yet to see a Christmas card about John the Baptist. Now, I'm not saying there necessarily should be one, but if you think about uh, the birth of Jesus, John was born about the same time. John is the cousin of Jesus. He's um, a couple months older than Jesus. Uh, you remember the story of Mary going to Elizabeth. Elizabeth is John's mother. And so Jesus and John are actually cousins. And, and so you would think, well, maybe there's this cute, Christmas card out there that has two little babies on it and one with a halo that is obviously Jesus you know and then one with John but I have yet to see that I don't see John the Baptist on a Christmas card because often we're not thinking of him as a baby we're thinking about him as this crazy camel hair wearing locust eating wild honey eating not domesticated honey that they had in Israel that a lot of uh, particularly the poor people ate uh, but he'd, he'd go out and fight the bees and get their wild honey you know, um, so this, this is not your normal guy, like not your normal religious leader, right? Um, he doesn't sell many Christmas cards. We want on our Christmas cards, we want cute baby Jesus, right? 
And maybe I've got Will Ferrell on my brain uh, doing Buddy the Elf, but I couldn't help but think of, of <laughs> and I'm, I'm not necessarily recommending this movie to you. It, it's got some funny scenes, but um, uh, Talladega Nights is a bit crude. Um, it, it has moments where it's border and raunchy, right? It's got some also some good moments of, of theology, and surprisingly, it's like PG-13, I think, um, which I'm like, really? Is it only that? Uh, which maybe is a commentary on society. But there's this prayer scene that I think is, is deeply theological in Talladega Nights, um, and, and it goes something like this. There, the family's gathered. Uh, if you know Will Ferrell's the main character, Ricky Bobby, who's a NASCAR driver, and he's got the family gathered at the table, and they've got this... this feast of KFC and Domino's and Taco Bell, right, and, and Gatorade, or, or Powerade, I'm sorry. And, and so Ricky Bobby is leading the prayer, and he says, Dear Lord Baby Jesus, or as our brothers in the South call you, Jesus, we thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. And I just want to take time to say thank you for my family. And then he goes on and on and prays some more. And he keeps saying, Dear Lord Baby Jesus, and at some point, his wife Carly speaks up, and she says, Hey, you know, sweetie, Jesus grew up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a little bit odd and off-putting to always say baby. <laughs> and Ricky responds, Well, I like the Christmas Jesus best. And when I'm saying grace, I'm going to say grace to baby Jesus. And you can say grace to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or anybody else you choose when you say grace. <laughs> So he continues, Dear tiny Jesus, with your golden fleece diapers and your little tiny fat balled up fist. <laughs> love that. Dear eight pound, six ounce, newborn infant Jesus. You don't even know a word yet, just a, a little infant and so cuddly, but still a little omni omnipotent. <laughs> we just thank you for all the races I've won. And he goes on and keeps praying. Thank you. And he ends it this way. Thank you for all your power and grace, dear baby God. <laughs> Amen. There's some theology in that, believe it or not. <laughs> and Richard Rohr, who actually is a theologian, unlike Will Ferrell, although maybe Will's a theologian, I don't know. Uh, Richard Rohr, who is a theologian, um, he said this about Jesus. He said, too often we make our Jesus too small. Too often we make our Jesus too small. And I think the prayer scene illustrates that for us, you know, that we want to picture Jesus one particular way, and we pray to Jesus in a certain way, and, and maybe you prefer baby Jesus with his little fat, balled-up fist. You know, maybe that's your preference, and that's okay. Uh, but I think the scriptures invite us to expand our ideas of who Jesus is, that he's not just a little chubby baby born at Christmas that we celebrate, that he's not just an escape from hell card. You know, he's not just a divine butler in the sky who shows up when we really get into trouble and we need some help. Uh, but he's the one um, who really is the one who brings salvation to the earth. I think, though, that illustrates, at least for me, why we want to lean in to baby Jesus is because sometimes we're making our God too small. And John the Baptist will have none of that. John the Baptist, I don't know that you'll ever see on a Christmas card, or if you do, please let me, please like take a photo of that and send that to me. Uh, and I'm sure it exists somewhere, so I won't be surprised when I actually see it. But in all of my life, I've never seen a John the Baptist Christmas card. And I'm not saying I should necessarily, but he's just not cute and cuddly. He's not nice. You know, like sometimes when you want to say something about somebody and it's not nice, you, you kind of follow that up with, but he's really a nice guy. And I'm not even sure we can say about that about John. I don't know the scriptures give us that witness because usually he's like always like pointing a finger at somebody and yelling at somebody and calling them a brood of vipers. And, and, and for us, though, I think that scripture invites us to, to just pause in this crazy busy season that is leading up to Christmas and really absorb Advent a bit. And really prepare ourselves for the coming of the Holy One who is more than a chubby baby in a manger. We also ignore John's voice at our own peril. It's 
no accident that he shows up in the lectionary text each year. Uh, and, and this Advent season is meant to highlight him because of the message he gives here. You know, again, noting he, we don't have the story of his birth. We have the story of him as an adult male living in a crazy way, at least it seems to us, with a, with a strong, strong message that is focused on repentance. And that's why he shows up in Advent. He's not cute and cuddly. He's not a chubby baby, but he's got a powerful message about God that reminds us that God is not just a chubby baby in a manger. God is not just our buddy Jesus, but God is also the one who calls us to repentance, who calls us to confession. And so we're going to look at that message today. Um, in this Matthew 3 text, we're going to look at a couple things. And first, I'm going I'm to help you with some of the setting of, of, of the prophetic messianic expectation that exists in Jesus' day. The prophets have been speaking of a Messiah to come. And so we're going to look at that because that's what John steps into, that setting, and that's so important for us to understand if we want to understand what John is saying and speaking to us today, too. And then um, we're also going to look at how uh, John calls us to prepare for the chubby baby Jesus. Um, he calls us to that repentance. And so I want to look a little bit at what is meant by repentance. Because sometimes when we use a word in English, uh, it means a certain thing to us. And I want to just explore a little bit deeper what John is saying when he says repent, what that would have meant for him. And also, sometimes we attach that word repentance as, well, you've got to drop your shoulders and just kind of slump around because you've realized you did something wrong, you offended God somehow, and you're like, oh, man, I'm a sack of dirt, you know. Um, and, and actually, that's not what repentance is for. Repentance is not like just wallow in the dirt. But repentance is recognizing who you are and who God is and not keeping God in that small little box. But repentance actually leads to joy. And that's so important, that as we prepare for the coming of the baby Christ, that we are entering into a season of repentance that leads to to a deeper joy. So that's our invitation. Uh, and I think for each of us, um, me, you, wherever you are on your faith journey, if you're brand new at it or if you're still exploring it or entertaining the idea of, of entering into a relationship with God in Christ, uh, or if you've been doing this for a while, wherever you are, it invites us to take that um, in the midst of all the glitter and the glam of the Christmas season that surrounds us, all the commercialism all the busyness that we engage, the parties we go to, the food we prepare, the presents we're buying and wrapping, the shopping we love to do, in the midst of all of that, it just gives us that word of pause to say repentance is what you need this season. Maybe you do all the other stuff too, but you need some repentance. So that's the invitation for all of us. So let's look at the setting of John the baptizer. He comes into uh, proclaiming a word of repentance, but it's not like he just walks into this vacuum. So for uh, the history of Israel, if you read the Old Testament books, and particularly the ones that come before the New Testament starts, uh, you've got multiple books of the prophets. And they've been prophesying uh, that usually goes back about 800 years before Jesus, 900 800 years before Jesus. And they're basically saying to the people of God, Israel, hey, uh, you're a little out of step here with God. You're, you're doing some things God doesn't want, and uh, you need to get right with God, or you're, you're going to live into the consequences of that. And usually Israel's like, yeah, 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 we got this. And then uh, the consequences come upon them, and then things are out of whack. And then, you know, that might be a foreign occupier, that might be Babylon or Assyria taking over the land, uh, subjecting them to foreign rule. Uh, it might look, uh, just in their individual lives, hard and more difficult. And, and they come to these moments of repentance. And they get right with God. And, and they get back on track. And so they go through this cycle of, of stepping off and, and hearing the words of the prophets that say, hey, repent. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't, and then they suffer the consequences if they don't. And then the prophets are like, see, <laughs> you know, and then um, they get back on track. And so there's this ebb of flow of life with God. And how familiar does that sound to us, right? 
I don't know about you, but I've never had this perfect journey, this perfect path of always walking in sync with God. It, it's these moments where I feel like, wow, I'm, 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 I think I'm really doing your will, God. I really think I'm doing what you want. And then, you know, six months later, I'm like, wait, how did I get here? What happened? You know? um, and how can I get back on track with God? And I think that's the, the reality of just being a human, you know, and that's the reality of Israel's story, too. And so the prophets are meant to come into those spaces of life of God's people and say, hey, you're a little bit off track. Uh, let me encourage you to get back on track. And what that needs is that needs repentance. Now, the prophets, 800 plus years before Jesus, they're talking about, um, you know, there's going to be one who comes and kind of fixes all this mess we're in. And, and we're calling him Messiah. We're calling him Christ, if you want to use the Greek word. I've said this before, but just so you know, this is so important. When we, when we say Jesus Christ, we're saying Jesus Messiah. Messiah is the Hebrew word. Christ is the Greek word. It's the same word, and it means the same thing. It's not a last name for Jesus, right? Uh, it's a title for Jesus. And so when we say Jesus Christ, that's a confession of who he is, that he's the fulfillment of what the prophets were talking about 800 years before his birth. And so the prophets continue to prophesy. So they're prophesying 800 years and 700 years and 600 years. And this is the time of the turmoil where Assyria comes in and Babylon comes in. And they're under this uh, second exile where they're taken to the land of Babylon. And they long to come home. And they finally come home about 500 years before Jesus' birth. And there's still this prophetic call that there'll be a Messiah who will come an anointed one of God, the Holy One of God, will come. And uh, about 400 years before Jesus, the prophets fall silent. And the Word says that the Word of God did not come through the mouth of the prophets. They were the voice piece of God. And so the people are longing to hear from God again on that level of prophetic announcement, but they're not having that. But the word has continued to live in their minds and hearts that one day a Messiah will come. So fast forward to Jesus' birth and John's birth. They are born into a time where there's this strong expectation that the Messiah will come. And that's where we find John as an adult on the banks of the River Jordan talking about repentance and an anointed one, a holy one more powerful than me, will come. Isaiah 11, for example, records this um, expectation. He, he uses language uh, that the people of Israel would have known well. Um, it's a little bit foreign to us, I think. He says, the stump of Jesse will uh, grow forth a branch. And you're like, okay. And maybe you've heard of the Jesse tree, uh, a Christmas tradition. I know some people still do the Jesse tree, some practices of, of the Christmas Advent season. Well, Jesse was the father of David. So if you're looking at a lineal descent and you say a stump of Jesse will grow forth a branch, a righteous branch, you're talking about a descendant of King David. And so we tie that into the prophetic expectation that the anointed one, the holy one, will be one who has a lineage line connection to King David and to his father, Jesse. <clears throat> the prophets fall silent. Uh, the messianic expectation continues. And so John the Baptist comes. Now, one of the things that the prophets said and that Jesus affirmed uh, that was a belief of his day was that before the Messiah comes, Elijah would return. Who's Elijah? Elijah's one of the greatest prophets. He's like the prophet's prophet, you know. When you think of the, the great lawgiver, you think of Moses, right, who, who comes down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. And he gives the other laws of God, the rules of God, the ways of following God. But when you think of, like, who's the greatest prophet of Old Testament times, you think of Elijah. And in Jesus' transfiguration, when he goes up on the mount, and, and there's this moment where uh, there's a revelation to uh, Peter, James, and John about who Jesus actually is, that the glory of God just peeks through, the veil is lifted. Uh, he's standing talking to Moses and Elijah. So the, the, the Jewish people recognize that the greatness of Elijah is one of their greatest prophets. And even today, even today when they do the Passover Seder, which is their highest celebration, they have a cup and an empty seat for Elijah. 
And they continue to proclaim in their belief that one day Elijah will come. Again, he will return, and that will be the forebearer, the forerunner of the Messiah. Now, in Christian belief, we believe that has already happened, that John the Baptist has taken on the spirit of Elijah. And Jesus affirms that. And he says, Elijah has, in fact, come in John the Baptist. Not that there's some reincarnation of, of Elijah, but that spirit of God that was in Elijah is now placed on John. And, and you have Elijah's presence through John. <clears throat> he comes uh, in that strong prophetic tradition, then, of Elijah, saying words that are sometimes hard to hear saying words that aren't welcome and cute and cuddly that show up on a Christmas card. I mean, I don't know if you've got a Christmas card that says repent for the forgiveness of your sins, but that's his message that comes uh, that is meant to help prepare us for the coming of the Christ. Then it, it's a powerful one. He says, look, I'm not talking in my own power and strength, but I'm speaking about the Holy One to come, the Messiah to come, the anointed one to come. John announces that the kingdom of God is at hand, we heard in that Matthew reading. Now, it doesn't mean that one day the kingdom of God will come, but when you say the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of God has drawn near, what we're talking about is the kingdom of God is right here. He's referring to Jesus at this point, and he's saying Jesus is bringing the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And he goes on, and in prophetic tradition, as Isaiah did, he says the words of Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight his paths. And that, friends, is what Advent is meant to be for us, a time where we prepare the way of the Lord to enter anew and afresh into our hearts, anew and again into our minds to welcome that Holy Spirit in a special way that the presence of Jesus has enabled. John repeatedly proclaims that the way that you prepare the way of the Lord is through repentance. How do you get ready for Jesus' coming? John says repentance. Now, again, <clears throat> I don't know this is on the top of your Christmas list, there's a lot to do to get ready for Christmas. But if you've got, I mean, how many of y'all make to-do lists for Christmas? You don't have to all raise your hands, but I know some of you do. And I do a lot of to-do lists too, right? And I don't, I'm just, you don't have to raise hands, but I'm just curious. Like, how many of you wrote repentance at the top of your list to get ready for Christmas? And that's what John's telling us. That's how you get ready for the coming of the King, for the coming of the Lord repentance. John preached repentance as uh, an act that leads to the forgiveness of God. That, that it's not you earn it by repentance, but you recognize who God is and who God's grace is, and you fall before God confessing your sins in repentance. And it's that practice that opens us up to God's grace and mercy. And so what is repentance then? What is John talking about? Repentance, we think, again, is where we just say, well, I'm sorry, God, screwed up again. Yeah, that's part of it. But repentance actually, in biblical terms, means a U-turn. You ever driven your car down a road and realized you're going the wrong way and you've got to do a U-turn? That's what repentance is. It's not just a, I feel sorry, God. But it's, I'm going to change the direction I'm going. I'm going to change the path I'm taking. And I'm going to turn and walk back to you. Repentance is about turning, turning back to God. Repentance involves necessarily the confession of our sins, as I said. And by sin, I, you know, I don't... Um, we don't like that word, especially at Christmas. That's no fun. That's a real kill joy, right? <laughs> yeah, you want to kill joy on your to-do list, right? Confess my sins at the top of your to-do list. That'll be fun. Uh, but that's what we're invited to in this Advent season. But it's not about just groveling and lamenting and, and being sorry. There, that's all part of it. But th there's more than this emotion to it. Uh, that, that day by day, we're doing some kind of examination. 
And that's the hope of Advent, that day by day you're doing some kind of examination of how your day has gone the day before. Maybe you look at the last 24 hours. You know, maybe, maybe you can carve out 10 minutes in your day to look at the last 24 hours and think about, God, here's where I tried to faithfully serve you. And here's where, by your grace, I think I hit the mark. And celebrate that. And thank God for his spirit and presence in your life. But at the same time, you know, just saying, hey, God, here's the places where I think I missed the mark. I didn't quite walk down the path you wanted me to walk down. And here's the cool thing is, is we don't have to hang and lament and shame our heads at that point. But confession is the starting point of the place of faith. John Wesley had this analogy. John Wesley, if you don't know, is uh, the unintentional founder of, of Methodism. Um, he really didn't mean to do it. He was just trying to get some Holy Spirit inspiration in the church. And he, he uh, was very faithful to some practices. Um, but he was a really uh, brilliant man, very smart man, not a perfect man. He had some personal weird stuff, too. Not, not like gross, yucky stuff, but just, you know, like, oh, yeah, he's human. Uh, so he's a human guy, but he's really smart. And I think God really put his spirit in him to help lead the church in a sense of revival. And he used this analogy, very smart man, very well-read man. And he said, um, think about uh, salvation as a, a house. Uh, now, you probably have seen a house with a porch, whether or not you have one. Uh, but I imagine you at least can picture a house with a porch on it. And that was very common in John Wesley's day. And he said, uh, there are three th key things in salvation. One is repentance, one is faith. And one is holiness. And so he gives this analogy. So again, here, the first thing he says, moving into salvation, is first repentance, then faith and holiness. Not that these are separate, distinct acts, but we, we name them slightly differently because they have different emphases, all part of our moving toward God, right? So he says repentance is kind of when you step up on the porch, of the house of salvation. And he said, on the porch, all are welcome. And, and that's where he says the grace of God comes to move in our spirits, to just move us toward God and invite us up onto the porch, the porch of repentance, the porch of the house. And he said, from there, when you cross the threshold of the door, you're moving in faith. You can sit on the porch and never go in the house, right? But then once you cross the door, that's kind of accepting Christ, believing in Jesus. You go into the house of God, the house of salvation. And then the holiness, the growth, is just moving into the different rooms of the house. So I thought this was a brilliant illustration, but the thing I want you to notice is the first step begins in repentance the first step of moving into God's grace is repentance the first step of really recognizing who Christ in, is in that manger is found in getting up on that porch beginning in a place of repentance but here's the cool thing repentance is not ultimately about sorrow but it's about joy Repentance is about your joy. If you want more joy in your life, begin in repentance, says John. John's message <clears throat> is God's message. And he tells us that Jesus of Nazareth has brought the kingdom of God near. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now, John's referenced Isaiah 11, and John knew the prophetic words. He studied them, as did Jesus. But I want you to listen to something John would have been familiar with. That as actually, if you read any of the lectionary text, if you follow that lectionary calendar, this is also in today's reading. Matthew 3 is, but also for the Advent season, this Isaiah 11 text is part of our Advent reading. I'm not going to read to you the text, but I'll just summarize it for you. It's this beautiful vision of the kingdom of God that has begun in Jesus that will come in its fulfillment. But this is what repentance leads you to. 
it leads you ultimately to this vision of God's kingdom. Now, Isaiah gave this prophecy 800 years before Jesus' birth, but this was part of that messianic expectation. What, what is ahead? What is the anointed one, the holy one, the one more powerful coming to do? He's coming to inaugurate the kingdom of God that leads us to this place of joy, the fullness of God's joy in your life. And here's what it looks like. He says, it's a place where wisdom and knowledge and righteousness and faithfulness are, and it's a place of peace. And on our second Sunday of Advent, we celebrate peace as a special emphasis. Um, traditionally in the church, and sometimes you'll see this done different ways, when we light the Advent candles, um, we name hope, peace, joy, and love. So the second Sunday of Advent is meant to be a celebration of God's peace. Well, listen to what the kingdom of God looks like, the peaceable kingdom. It's a place of peace where there's no more violence and destruction. Boy, that sounds really good to me right about now. Anybody sick of the war in Ukraine? You know, God bless the Ukrainian people who are struggling through a terrible winter right now. But how long will this keep going on? Or the war in Yemen? Or the war in Ethiopia? Or the war in et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Or the violence in our society? I mean, just last two weeks ago, I think it was, we heard about the terrible shooting at the nightclub. Yo, know, and, and the shooting at the Walmart in Chesapeake, Virginia. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what begins in repentance leading to joy is this peaceable kingdom where violence and destruction do not exist anymore. Humans and animals do not hurt and kill one another. I don't know what that means for you steak eaters, but <laughs> in the peaceable kingdom of God, you hear this, the wolf and the lamb lie down together. I figure God's got, a, what, God's got it figured out. You're, whatever you love on this earth is going to be so much better <laughs> in the joy to come. But it continues, the leopard and the goat play together. The calf and the lion, the cow and the bear graze together. I've never seen a bear grazing. <laughs> but that's the prophecy of the peaceable kingdom to come. They live in harmony, and a little child shall lead them. A place brimming with God alive. And as the prophet John declared, we will be baptized into the Spirit of God, and God will make his home in our presence. God comes to us in the fullness of the kingdom. Now, here's the flip side of that invitation to the peaceable kingdom. And maybe you like this, but this is the choice that John puts before us. He, he sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming. Now, who are they? They're the religious leaders, right? Right? They're the uppity pastors, right? <laughs> They're the ones who know the Bible and are going to tell you all about it, right? These are the ones who the people look to as religious authorities, as the people who, oh gosh, they got to know. And they come out to John, which is really intriguing to me. They come out to him for baptism, confessing their sins, which is really interesting. I mean, again, this picture of John is not like cuddly, cute, nice guy, right? This is camel hair wearing, I just imagine crazy hair that hasn't been brushed in about two years, right? I mean, he probably invented dreadlocks, I don't know. <laughs> He's eating like locust and wild honey. I mean, wild honey sounds nice. The locust, I can do without. I don't know, but maybe that's a delicacy. I think it is in some parts of the world. So they're coming out to him. The religious leaders say, this guy's got something going on. So it's all the people coming out to him. It says all of Jerusalem, all of Judea, which is the whole southern region of Israel, all the region of the Jordan River, which stretches up toward Galilee, all these people are coming out to him. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people are coming out to John, including the religious leadership, seeking his wisdom and advice and his blessings his naming of God's spirit in their lives. And he sees them, and he says, you snakes. 
you brood of vipers. There's a welcome. And he goes on, the axe is lying at the root of each tree. And those trees that do not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Bear fruit worthy of repentance, he tells them. John sees through their naming, their salvation because of a title. John sees through their naming, their giftedness in God because of who they are. In other words, if you were a Pharisee or a Sadducee, you first claim God's grace in your life. How? Not necessarily by what you learned and all that. You certainly stood up in pride with that. But you claimed it as a child of Abraham. As did all the Jewish people. We claim that we are God's chosen because we are children of Abraham. We are descendants of of Abraham. And John's got a strong word there. He says, look, if you want to rely on titles, if you want to rely on some label, I got news for you. God can raise up children out of these stones. Now, the stones don't have any lineal ancestry to Abraham. They don't have any animated life in them at all. John's word is, if we, and this comes to us today, if we are content to sit with the title of just being a Christian that doesn't have any fruit-bearing repentance in it, I think we're missing the point. If you're content to walk around this Christmas saying, I'm a Christian, and you're not going to put anything into that effort to seek Jesus more, that you think you got it all figured out and your ticket's punched for heaven, John kind of cuts through that busyness and craziness of Christmas where we're holding on to the cars with cute, chubby baby Jesus. And he says, there's a word for you. God's calling you to repentance. That's a word for me. I think it's a word for you. And that's, friends, why I really love Advent. Not because it, it, it sucks the joy of Christmas out of Christmas before Christmas. <laughs> but it really is meant to prepare us for Christmas. And that goes all the way up to Christmas Eve. We have 40 days Like the 40 days of Lent, we have 40 days of Advent that are meant to help us really get ready for Jesus, to really prepare the way of the Lord into our hearts, into our minds, into our bodies and our spirits. The path for the Lord to come in to your heart and mind and spirit this Christmas season begins in repentance confessing our sins and knowing and trusting the promise of God that is as we are faithful to confess God is so faithful much more to forgive our sins and the scriptures say as far as the east is from the west and that's why when you engage the practice of repentance this season you don't have to lament in shame you lean into the joy of the promise because Christ has taken that from you. May it be so with us in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It was at um, <clears throat> that Passover feast of liberation where Jesus sits down with the disciples some 2,000 years ago And they had, I expect, a place for Elijah, as was the tradition of the Jewish people. But I'm real curious what Jesus did with that. Because he had told us that Elijah had come. And 
John that the word of God, the forerunner of God, the prophetic voice of God had come announcing the one more powerful. And it's when we gather around this table that we remember that. This is not just a cute, cuddly baby. But this is the Savior who's come for the forgiveness of our sins who invites you into a relationship that begins in our repentance. And the promise is, is that God will not only forgive you and welcome you into his family before the stones to raise you up as children of Abraham, but the promise is that that, that spirit that spoke through the prophets so powerfully that spirit of the living God that hovered over the waters at creation and brought life into being. That that spirit of God will dwell in you. Whew. That's hard to wrap your head around. And yet it's all part of what we celebrate at Christmas, the mystery of the incarnation that God loved you so much, that God desperately wanted you so much that he came to bear our sins so that we might know his grace and forgiveness and live as his children of light, children of the resurrection, in the power of that spirit. So at this table, we remember that. We come acknowledging our sins, confessing our sins before God and entering in to his grace. And we do that in the common, ordinary symbols of bread and wine, bread and the fruit of the vine. That night, Jesus was with the disciples at the Passover meal took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks to God and he raised it to heaven. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. And remember, my love and grace poured out for you on the cross. And he took a cup, perhaps the cup of Elijah. And he raised it to heaven and he gave thanks to God. And he says, drink from this, all of you. Now, I don't know it was the cup of Elijah. But it was a cup of blessing. And he wanted you to drink and remember that in the forgiveness of your sins, through the pouring of his blood, you enter into God's blessing and God's joy. You begin life in the peaceable kingdom, awaiting the fullness of that joy. This is God's table, the table of the Lord Jesus, and he bids everyone here welcome. You don't have to be a United Methodist to dine at the table of Jesus. If you know him or if you seek him, even if you don't know him, if you just want to know more about him, he bids you welcome at this table. So I want to invite our, our servers to come forward as uh, we prepare to invite you to come and dine with Jesus. We have a gluten-free station, which will be on this side, and then we'll have... Um, I test <laughs> bread on this side, regular. Uh, so let me give y'all a squirt. Bob, I'm going to ask you to, uh, and if you'll just take some and pass it around.
for the blood of Christ. If you prefer, uh, we still want to be mindful of the concerns about COVID, and I'll be holding this if your preference is to receive it prepackaged. Um, so come, the table is prepared. Jesus bids you welcome, confessing your sins before God, coming in joy, knowing God's forgiveness and grace for you. Come. with me. God, for this holy mystery, for the mystery of the incarnation to come, and you in our hearts and minds, we give you thanks. Help us this Advent season to be yours, to enter into a time of thinking about who we are and who you are. And God, keep before us a heart of repentance that leads to joy, to the fullness of life in you. We are yours, God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dan. As you was talking about um, preparing and repentance and coming up on, on the porch, it reminded me of that, that very famous picture of the person at the door and Jesus is on the other side and the very distinct very important piece of that picture is that it's up to us to knock it's up to us to receive he gives the invitation and all we've got to do is knock and receive so as we do prepare for that gift this season Let's be joyful to be on that porch 
and that we knocked and he opened that door for each and every one of us. Let's be joyful. Stand and sing with us this morning. Today. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you for your presence here. Um, go from this place as the people of God, repenting and yet living in the joy of God's presence in your life. Go with good news then to share love and service to everyone you meet. However you can do that, whatever places you find yourselves in this week, if you're out shopping, maybe letting somebody in front of you in line, you know, Maybe just letting them get that last thing that you were about to grab. Um, but in what ways can you bless someone? Just be a sign and a witness to God's love. God's immense and powerful love. To go in peace, go in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.